Good morning, everyone on the West Coast. Good afternoon to everybody on the East Coast. My name is Larry Compton. Thank you very much for joining us today for our webinar on Clear ID 3, Leveraging Actions and Smart Objects. Um, I will be joined a little bit later uh, in the webinar by our Vice President, uh, Charles Garino, and uh, we'll be taking questions uh, throughout the webinar, and Charles will help with addressing those questions uh, at the end of the webinar. Uh, so at the end of the webinar. So if you're not familiar, uh, on your GoToWebinar control panel, there is a questions panel. Uh, go ahead and expand that and have that out throughout the broadcast so that you can uh, type down your questions as they come up and submit those to us, and we'll do our best to address uh, all of those uh, at the end of the uh, webinar. And, um, and uh, to do that, just go to the View menu on the panel if you don't see that uh, questions uh, panel. Uh, you can pull that off and expand it, uh, resize it, et cetera, to get it out of your way on the screen. Uh, for those new, I see a lot of familiar names in the attendee list. I also see a lot of new names. Uh, thank you all for joining us. Uh, a little bit about our company, Ocean Systems 30th anniversary this year. Uh, we've been on GSA contract schedule now for 20 years. Uh, obviously, uh, for those familiar, uh, pioneer in forensic video solutions since 1998 with our detective systems. Uh, have those uh, uh, deployed throughout the world. Uh, we provide hardware, software, training, and professional services, and like to say that we not only provide the solutions, we also build relationships. Some of the products uh, in our portfolio are purpose-built multimedia and digital evidence hardware solutions. So that's towers, rack mounts, mobile solutions, uh, such as laptops and things of that nature. Designed for the ground from the ground up uh, for the applications that you intend to deploy on those systems. Uh, we've been doing that, like I said, for uh, a, a number of years and have thousands of systems deployed throughout uh, various federal, state, uh, local law enforcement agencies. Um, our high-speed RAID storage, which is uh, SAS3 connected, scalable, uh, redundant high-speed storage up to 4,800 megabytes per second. Uh, Read-write speeds, uh, so extremely fast. We can scale beyond one petabyte by daisy-chaining those, uh, so some really cool storage technologies. Uh, and of course, all of our systems are application tested and supported by us in-house. The system you see pictured on your screen here is a custom uh, tower. It's one of our towers with a hardware write blocker built into the device uh, as requested by one of our customers who's also leveraging it for their uh, digital evidence applications like in case FTK, uh, things of that nature. Of course, Omnivore, Omnivore Field Kit, our uncompressed screen capture solutions for acquisition and processing uh, in our portfolio. And one of the newest products in our portfolio, Input Ace, uh, which is a dynamic workflow engine for law enforcement. Input Ace specializes in the ability to open and uh, get access to those proprietary digital CCTV files. It provides a number of efficiencies uh, in regards to accessing those files, playing those files, rewrapping them, transcoding them, enhancing and reporting on uh, those files. And then Clear ID, of course, which we're here today to talk about for image and video clarification. Uh, Clear ID uh, in Photoshop, and we also have our Clear ID filters in Avid Media Composer. So we'll be talking about Clear ID today. And then Detective, our flagship product, uh, which is uh, a suite of filters that works inside of Avid Media Composer Nonlinear Editor, the world's leading uh, nonlinear editor for professional production, and Quick DME our digital evidence and viewer manager, which supports all digital files, provides end-to-end -end auditing uh, and uh, integration. Uh, we have an integrated player manager in there uh, to manage all of those proprietary players uh, that you uh, receive out in the field from the various systems and associate them within Quick DME so that other users uh, can automatically view and, and access uh, those files. So Clear ID image clarification for Adobe Photoshop. Well, let's talk about some of the things in Clear ID version 3. Some of the things new with version 3 over our prior uh, version 2. Clear ID uh, 3.3 supports Adobe Photoshop CS4 through CC 2018. It is entirely 64-bit as with Photoshop these days. Uh, 
almost all multimedia applications have uh, gone to fully 64-bit. Um, contextual help and hot links were included in the new, brand new version 3 interface. We have bigger plug-in previews to leverage those uh, much larger displays that you have on your systems. Uh, and we can also, you know, force it to open the plug-in windows and, and smaller by holding down the shift key when you select one of our plugins through the interface. We have an improved import function shortcut key, F6, which allows us to bring in, when we're bringing images into Photoshop, uh, hashes the images uh, along the way as we bring them into Photoshop. And in my experience in testing has been faster even than uh, going through Bridge or Photoshop to import layer stacks and things of that nature. We added some new filters in Clear ID version 3, double unsharp and a mask uh, being one of the big ones under the sharpening tab. And uh, we've added more channels into our interactive channel selector for uh, interrogating our uh, images and video uh, as well. A lot of efficiency improvements in version 3, including our FFT filters uh, perform much faster, uh, layer stack processing much faster, a lot of new keyboard shortcuts and uh, things of that nature throughout the interface that save a tremendous amount of time uh, when processing. Um, so we'll show off a few of those. Added the quick export capabilities uh, on the uh, tab seven for quickly exporting just the top layer or all of the layers or only the active layers uh, and exporting those out as uncompressed TIFF or uncompressed PNG images. And with ClearID version 3.3, we can now record ClearID filters as Photoshop actions, which is another time-saving feature and capability for both hotkeys and batch processing, which is what we're going to be talking a little bit about today. And uh, another uh, hotkey that we introduced with 3.3 was the F11 to bring up your previous function and dialog and settings. So if you had just uh, applied a particular uh, function, want to go back and apply that uh, again, F11 brings up the same filter and function and settings. And Clear ID will be able to be applied to smart objects as well. So we'll show you some of that capability uh, and discuss uh, Clear ID 3.4, which we intend to be having out here very shortly. So Photoshop actions, what are they? Well, an action is really just a macro. It's a recorded series of tasks. Uh, we play that action across a single file or a batch of files, and it performs said task on those files. Um, Clear ID leverages actions for things like our hotkeys uh, and things of that nature. Photoshop uh, provides us a way of doing uh, batch processing through their image processor script, which we can also uh, leverage through Bridge. So if you use Bridge for your uh, uh, file navigation, uh, we can get to it through there as well. Actions themselves are stored in what's called action sets, and Photoshop installs several action sets by default. Uh, the default action set is automatically loaded when you install Photoshop, and there are several others that ship and, uh, and are available to you through the action flyout menu, which I'll show you momentarily. Action sets themselves can be exported as ATN files or action files. So when we create custom actions for processing, we can go ahead and save those out with our case folder uh, as documentation uh, on those steps, uh, etc. When ClearID 3 is installed, we have three action sets now that we're including with 3.3. Our base action set, which everyone is familiar with uh, that's been using ClearID for any time, um, which has our hotkeys such as F6 uh, for importing images or uh, uh, files and F7 for launching our interface, uh, F11 for re repeating that last step now, F12 uh, for undoing the last uh, step or deleting the top layer, so on and so forth. Um, we also include now a, another set called Processing Example, uh, which is a DCT JPEG detector example. Uh, that allows us, to, uh, helps us uh, identify DCT compression uh, within images. And so that example is included. And a third set where you can store your end user recorded actions. So as you create additional maybe hotkey actions like uh, we're going to do today for maybe 
a single key press to run a verification report or create the slideshow rather than having to launch the interface uh, and go through, etc. But as, as I mentioned briefly, um, if you're creating and processing uh, with actions in your casework, you're certainly going to want to uh, export, or we highly recommend you consider archiving and exporting those ATN files, those actions, with your case folder. So we'll show you how to do that uh, today as well. Um, so, but clear ID and action. So let's take a let's take a quick look again how we get to the actions windows actions uh, to to open the actions or uh, as I have a, a button on my toolbar. Um, our default set I talked about, which has been loaded with Clear ID uh, for, for many versions, that includes hotkeys for accessing the Clear ID interface, as well as uh, hotkeys for various other tasks. And now, when we go to the flyout menu, there are two other action sets which I just loaded by clicking on them here. I have the processing example action set, and then the third, which is our uh, set that we have included for you to record your own actions and hotkeys uh, within the interface. Uh, so uh, with that said, um, I'm going to go through and we'll process an image real quick, create a action for uh, 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 saving out the verification report. Uh, so to do that, again, uh, I'm going to F6 to bring the image in. Uh, I'm going to grab this cell phone image bring this in and we want to uh, grab this plate, uh, which I've processed, uh, as you can imagine, a few times, so I'm a bit familiar with the settings, but I'm um, going to back into the interface via F7, and you see as I pressed F7, it went to the action to launch our interface. I'm going to crop to selection in this case, and what we have is a photo through a windshield of a license plate. Uh, and here, I'm going to go into F7 again and leverage our interactive D blur to uh, uh, address this uh, out of focus image and try and bring it back into focus, uh, convolution, deconvolution. Uh, and in this case, I'm probably going to be upwards around eight. And then I want to uh, increase the noise floor uh, and address uh, that as well. So I can turn my preview on and off, see before and after. And let's say that's all I want to do. And now I'm going to save this out and create a verification report, save as, put it into my process, call it something like Jeep plate. Save it as an uncompressed TIFF, no compression. And now I want to create my verification report. So um, to do that, of course, we're going to go F7, go to our verification report tab, choose generate verification report, and click OK. But I want to create an action or a hotkey for this verification report. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to select this action set, clear ID, end user recorded action. And down below in the uh, bottom of the actions panel, I'm going to create a new action. So there's create a new action set and create a new action. Um, make sure you have the set where you want that action recorded, selected. I'm going to create a new action and call this verification report. And it is now recording the action. So all of my mouse movements are going to be recorded. Now it's important to know that with Clear ID, um, when recording actions, you need to access Clear ID through the filter menu rather than the F7 action. So we're going to go to the filter menu. And at this point, I can go to Clear ID workflow and bring up the interface this way pop over the verification report, choose it, select OK. It's going to ask me where I want to save the verification report. Done. And it creates my verification report. With that being done, I can click Stop Recording on the Action. 
and I have now created an action called verification report. Now we can do a few things here. We can color code this. We can assign it key values, um, uh, shortcut key values, which I'm going to do. And I'm going to do that by highlighting it and just double clicking on the, the, the uh, title bar where I can rename it, so on and so forth, or assign a function key and color coding. So I'll show you what both of those do. I'm going to put this on F4, and then you can choose whether or not you want Shift and Control plus F4 or what have you. Uh, so for instance, if I had F7, it's going to say, oh, well, F7 is already being used, so you're going to have to use Shift to do that. So I'm going to put this on F4 for the verification report, and I'll color code it red, click OK. And you're saying, well, it didn't show the color coding. The Actions panel is in detail view here right now. If we go up to the Flyout menu, they also have a button mode, which allows you to just press the button to run that action. So if I press the F7 Clear ID button, it's going to launch the interface. If I press my new verification report button, it's going to run the verification report. Uh, action that I just created. I like to keep this in uh, detail mode because sometimes I'm recording uh, complex actions when creating demonstratives and things of that nature. We can expand the actions to see the steps included in the action and we could continue recording the action. Um, maybe I also want to run a, a slideshow with the save or the same action or set up a new action for a slideshow. So let's do that one more time. Action, we'll say slideshow. Click record. Remember to go through the filter menu when calling Clear ID and recording actions. Clear ID workflow, tab seven, slideshow presenter. Okay. Tell it where I want to save. I'm going to put it into my processed folder. And then I can stop recording my action and the slideshow is created showing our layer of steps and processing, uh, etc. And now I have a slideshow action that I inadvertently placed in my default actions folder. I want to show you how to move. Simply select, left click and drag it to the folder you want it in. And so I have now have it in my end user recorded actions folder. So recording actions with Clear ID's interface, the important things are to number one, which action set are you in? Uh, make sure you're in the proper action set. Number two, call Clear ID filters through the filter menu, either by going to the workflow interface or directly to the filters themselves through the filter menu. And that is the gist of uh, creating uh, an action. Let's do a little batch process real quick to show you how that works within Photoshop. I'm going to close out of this image. And I'll bring in another image from our case folder. Let's go into frames. I've got several frames from a very dark video here, and there's not a lot we're going to be able to do other than, in this case, uh, some levels adjustments. So I'm going to minimize my action panel, but we can see very dark footage. Um, I want to just create an action for adjusting the uh, levels using color safe levels and maybe some minor edge enhancement and save that action and run it across all of those images in that folder. So to do that, I'm going to select this action set. I want to create the action in. I'm going to say new action, and I'm going to call this CSL plus edge enhance and record. Now I can go to my filter menu and directly to or through the interface. But again, we have to go through the filter menu. I'm going to go into color safe levels. I'll increase the size of my preview here a little bit. And we're going to show gamut clip, see what we're affecting. And I think somewhere right in here, probably, and adjust our gamma, our mid. I'm going to bring this up. And 
very, very highly compressed, very noisy image, obviously, sensor noise, the darkness, et cetera. So <clears throat> as we do that, uh, we're oversaturating the image. So I'm going to bring the saturation down a little bit uh, here. And I'm still recording my action. I'm going to go back into the filter menu, clear ID workflow, and go to sharpen, edge enhancer, click OK. And just do some minor sharpening, just to basically show you some uh, of the uh, steps <clears throat> for applying multiple filters in an action. Um, so just uh, basic sharpening of this, sharpening being all about presentation. And that's all I really want to do with these images. So I'm going to stop recording my action. So here's my color safe levels and edge enhance, and I want to apply that across. Uh, an entire folder of images or multiple images. I can do that a few different ways. I can do it through Photoshop, uh, obviously, in the File, Scripts, Image Processor, or through Bridge, and, and Bridge's Tools menu, Photoshop Image Processor. Works the exact same interface is brought up, does the exact same thing. So. Maybe I want this in its own action set, though, so that I can export it out. So let me create a new action set and call it my case name, case one, two, three, four, five. And I'm just going to move this action into this action set. And I'm actually going to export this action set to save it with my case files. So I'm going to select the action set. I'm going to go to the action flyout menu. And I'm going to say Save Actions. And I want to put this into this folder, case12345 ATN file, and save that out. So now I have access to that, um, and it's going to be archived with my case information. So let me close out of here without saving. And I'm going to run this action across all of those images in that folder now by going to File, Scripts, Image Processor. The Image Processor window is pretty straightforward. We select our source, where we're saving things to, how we want to save them, and which action we want to run. So I'm going to go Source. is going to be my Case 12345 Original Frames. I'm going to select my destination, Case 12345 Processed. I want to save them as TIFF files into that process folder. And down below, I get to choose the action I want to run. You can see only the action sets that are loaded in my actions panel are available to me. And this is the case whether you access Image Processor through Photoshop or through Bridge. I want to run the CSL and EE action on all of those images. And then I simply click Run. And it's going to go through and apply those steps to all of the images within that folder uh, and save those out to the process folder as TIFF files. So for batch processing, uh, very helpful for um, you know, processing multiple files that you need to apply the same adjustments to. Uh, this should only take a moment to run through here. And all of the files are being processed. We can cook this and walk away and, and be working on something else if we'd like to. So that's the beauty of batch processing. And hotkeys obviously expediting our, our workflow along the way as well. Am I on? You are on? There we go. <laughs> I was pushing my little button on the thing. I guess while this is uh, processing, um, just wanted to point out, I, I know when I first started playing around with this interface a little bit, there's some subtleties to uh, where you click on that, that bar right there um, to make it, uh, if, whether you're renaming the file or you're opening that interface right. where you can set the, the F keys and such. So if you're clicking where the name, like on verification report, you'll get that edit window, you'll see a box, you can just rename it right there. If you click anywhere over on the the gray area, then you get the hotkey settings area. And along with the, the button mode that Larry had showed, you could highlight any of these right in this interface and go down and click the play button. 
and that that'll launch them. So I don't I don't personally know how much value there is in going to the button mode. Uh, you don't see the the action sets you know separated there. So it's just a, a panel of buttons. But um, yeah, so here we go. Done bacon. So I'll let Larry get back to. No, that's fine. You know, that's you, fine. Showing uh, you what he did. Yeah, so so basically all the images were processed using that same action. And the other method I was showing while you were talking there is, you know, you mentioned double-clicking the name or double-clicking on the bar brings up the action options. Of course, uh, having it highlighted, you can get to uh, action options and playback options, um, et cetera, as well through the fly-out menu on the actions panel, just a, an FYI. So key things are, um, you know, with actions in, in – Clear ID is when you're recording actions to launch Clear ID through the filter menu rather than through the action uh, that calls the, the interface. Yeah, uh, and to the F7, yeah. Exactly. And then to obviously <clears throat> pay attention to where you're recording the action, what set you're recording, because you can't export individual actions. Um, you can only export the action sets. Uh, so um, you'll want to make sure that they're organized in, in a way that uh, is going to make sense to you. I typically would create a case folder with any actions that I'm going to use in that particular case and then export that action set uh, to my case files. Um, the other way I mentioned of launching uh, is getting into image processors, getting into bridge and doing it through bridge. So I'll show that real quick uh, before we pop over and take a, a quick look at uh, Clear ID 3 and smart objects. But uh, if I go into this case folder, you know, I can navigate into the uh, files. If my system will refresh. Go to the tools menu, Photoshop batch or image processor. I prefer using the image processor. Uh, batch will allow you to do the similar sort of thing, but brings up our image processor interface again from there. So that is the gist of accessing and recording actions uh, using ClearID v3. And now uh, you can create custom hotkey actions you know, for uh, running the verification report. So if I go into my cases and I bring this file into Photoshop, still have all my layers, want to run my verification report. Now I'm just going to press uh, F4 and it's going to allow me to save out that verification report. And bing, bang, boom, that's done. My settings and everything included in the report. So hotkeys, batch processing, uh, just expediting your workflow, leveraging that capability. Remember, when recording actions, launch through the filter menu. Okay, so um, that is the gist of, of uh, recording and leveraging actions, uh, how to get in, record, and uh, create actions that way. Um, I am going to now talk a little bit about video in Photoshop. I'm sure I know many of uh, the names in the list have been doing video in Photoshop for a while. It's actually been a, a capability since CS3 extended. It is now, uh, of course, uh, all, all versions since then uh, extended up to CS5, and then CS6 didn't have an extended, and of course all the CC versions have that capability for dealing with pre predominantly um, you know, standard video files. You're not going to find any, uh, you know, find any uh, uh, magic ability to open containers. It doesn't ex understand that sort of thing. So MPEG-4, MOV files, AVI, if uh, it understands the codec, that sort of thing. When we're working in, with video in Photoshop, we need to convert the video to a, a smart object. Let's call it a smart object. And we apply filters to that smart object. If we don't, when we apply a filter to video, it's only going to apply that filter to the frame you have your playhead marked on, which I'll show you here momentarily. So when applying filters to video in Photoshop, we need to convert them to smart objects. And then smart uh, filters can be um, uh, turned on and off, as we'll show here momentarily. Um, so smart Objects are basically not another non-destructive uh, workflow within Photoshop. It preserves the source content. We can get in and edit the smart object uh, independently. Uh, we'll show uh, how that works um, 
And then uh, filters get applied as adjustment layers so that you can turn those filters on and off, uh, et cetera, and, uh, of course. And with ClearID version uh, 3, uh, 3 and uh, soon to be released 3.4, we're, we're uh, leveraging or giving you the ability to leverage uh, ClearID filters now on smart objects as well. Um, so typically, the ClearID workflow with video in Photoshop is going to be somewhat limited uh, for a few reasons. Uh, one uh, is that we're not going to be doing things like frame averaging, uh, you know, on a video file uh, within Photoshop. So we're typically assessing our media, identifying the type of compression, maybe doing that using interactive channel selector. Um, adjusting any focus issues uh, with interactive de-blur, uh, adjusting contrast with color safe levels or curves, and then sharpening our presentation, right? Doing, if we're going to do any sharpening, and then rendering that video back out as a new video. So again, a non-destructive uh, workflow um, and creating our report uh, at the end of that. Uh, the ClearID Smart Filters, primary differences there are when dealing with video in Photoshop over images is that uh, it's limited precision. By that I mean we're not, uh, uh, you know, going from 8-bit to 16-bit mode with video. It just doesn't exist. Uh, so we don't get that additional precision that the 16-bit mode uh, provides. The other thing to understand uh, about working with video in Photoshop is geometric correction concerns. So, you know, anytime we're resizing the video, um, things of that nature, um, we can be creating, uh, obviously, inducing blur unless all dimensions go to 200%. Uh, if we rotate not in 90 degree multiples, uh, things uh, of that nature. So, if you're going to do aspect ratio correction, um, we typically recommend doing it uh, last, uh, if, if then, uh, depending on, you know, a, a few things. Um, so why don't we take a quick look at, um, at that issue of bringing video into Photoshop. I'm going to close out here, minimize my actions panel, and I'm just going to go file open and browse to a uh, video in here, bring that video in, and you can see by opening the video file, it's opened up my timeline panel, um, and of course, as with uh, all of the uh, panels in Photoshop, I have a number of options. I uh, have the timeline shortcut keys uh, enabled through the flyout menu in the timeline panel uh, so that I can use um, the, you know, uh, space bar to play and stop and that sort of thing. I also deselect allow frame skipping uh, in this uh, flyout panel as well. And we can access things like uh, getting our comments if we add comments to the video and exporting them, um, looping, you know, uh, all of those sorts of things, including uh, set the timeline frame rate uh, so we can manage and change the uh, frame rate of the timeline there. So I have uh, zoom buttons down below on my timeline. I'm just going to expand it a little bit. Uh, I'm going to play through or pull through my playhead through this video real quick. And maybe I just want to grab this section of the car. So I'm going to trim it down by grabbing the end or the beginning, excuse me, bringing it to my playhead. And then let's see where do I want to trim out at. So somewhere in there is fine. I'm just going to trim out. and. Maybe I want to apply, again, uh, color safe levels or something to this video. I need to convert this to a smart object or it's only going to apply any filters that I apply to the frame that my playhead is parked on. Uh, so I can do that a few different ways. One, right-clicking on the uh, object, the video object, and you'll notice in, uh, the, in the layers panel under the video group that this has a video icon uh, currently. If I convert that to a smart object, it changes that icon to a smart object icon and also changes the layer color in your timeline panel so you can clearly see uh, that it's been converted to a smart object. And now I can work with this uh, video in a number of different ways, um, but I'm going to go ahead and apply a clear ID filter. Uh, in this case, I'm going to press F7. We'll go into 
color safe levels, for example, and do some levels adjustments. Maybe some slight adjustments, bring my saturation down a little bit, and say OK. And now that filter is going to apply to the entire video. So we've created the smart object. We've applied a smart filter, which we can turn on and off, just like any other layer. And we can continue to stack filters on here. So I could you know, stack on sharpening, uh, noise removal, uh, things of that nature uh, as well. And uh, just throw on an ultimate sharpener. And boom, we have uh, two filters stacked on top of each other. Uh, in the smart filter workflow. And so the key here is, again, making sure that when you bring video into Photoshop, converting it to a smart object before applying filters. If we had a video where we needed to do aspect ratio corrections, um, anything done outside of the Clear ID workflow, uh, for the most part, not everything, we are uh, improving this for 3.4 that's coming out uh, soon, uh, the smart object workflow and documentation. Um, but for things like if I just go up to the edit menu to transform this object, that's not going to be recorded in our uh, report um, because this isn't part of our, you know, our, our suite. Um, so I'll show you now if I F7 and do a verification report on this uh, video project, I'll create the report. And just like an image report, we're going to have, you know, our thumbnail and our layer settings, smart object layer, and then our individual settings for each of the filters that we've applied, all documented for us, including our version information, system information, and the like. Uh, however, if we had uh, done things outside, like going to edit menu, free transform, or, or transform, you know, uh, to flip this video or rotate it, um, that's not going to be uh, documented in my system's chugging here. So, <laughs> uh, but that wouldn't be documented in the report. So, um, we're going to be detailing more of that out in uh, the three four documentation. Uh, so. so that's actually a good point. What Larry's uh, the chugging thing? You see these little vertical, yeah. uh, horizontal green lines in there. So. It's a, uh, you know, you're moving your slider over certain sections, and there, I don't know of, and maybe maybe there isn't, Larry, and uh, <clears throat> I don't know of that, that, that there's a render the video like people would be used to seeing in Avid. Maybe, maybe there is that feature in here, but you're seeing in this cool. live preview, it's as he moves it over, it's actually rendering those frames. So if you ever went through the whole thing, <laughs> ah, yeah. <laughs> so you know where your where your um your temp files yeah, like, and there's some Photoshop uh, settings in there to optimize those types of things. Um, right, right. So it, yeah, I mean you can render the video. The you can. Yeah, you can render okay. the video out, of course, and I can. Uh, you know, once we're done, rendering the video out is uh, relatively simple, um, either through the file um, export uh, or okay. through the shortcut uh, in the bottom. However, you're creating a new video, video at that point, right? Right. right. So, so, so you really can't get around that bar in the timeline uh, that you were just showing uh, shows what frames have been loaded into memory so that we can right. easily get back, you know, and access those frames. So as I move this playhead, it's probably difficult to see, but let me zoom in a little bit on my timeline. You can see as I move it, it's loading those frames into memory. Um, and so those are now stored in the memory. Once I've done my processing, I can go into, you know, rendering uh, through a button down here uh, at the bottom of the interface. Uh, this little arrow button and save the video out this way, tell it where I want to save. Um, I can use uh, the media encoder presets um, for exporting out to uh, H.264 or QuickTime files and uh, the presets drawn from a media encoder or do an image sequence and export out, you know, all of the individual frames as images. Of course, range, all, 
or just our work area or just certain frames, etc., uh, all through the rendering. Um, but you can't really get around this preloading of the frames into the memory issue. So when you start dealing with UHD files from cell phones and IP cameras with very high resolutions, you're going to notice, you know, some degradation. I hear a lot of uh, folks talking about, uh, competitors talking about how hardware doesn't matter. They can run it on, you know, any system. And that that's very true of ours as well. We can pretty much run our software on any Windows system. The advantage of having the proper hardware is uh, is efficiency and with multimedia accuracy um, hardware has a lot to do with playback of multimedia uh, and accurate playback so um, hardware does matter uh, and just to, to reiterate that um, the one last thing I wanted to talk about in regards to working with video and Photoshop is that when we're doing the, any resizing or correcting of sizes uh, in there um, that basically uh, we transform, do a free uh, transform, we need to change our default image interpolation. Um, the reason being that anytime you use transform on a smart object, it's going to use your default image interpolation. So let me convert this to a smart object. I can do it uh, this way. Um, and then let's try and transform again and see if my system crashes. Um, I try to do just a, a flip um, or rotate. Uh, I'm going to flip vertical. There it goes. Worked this time. So flipped vertical, um, and then uh, that's you know basically going to leverage when it does this the default interpolation. So I'm going to do a Control Z and step back to adjust your default. Go to Preferences, General. And under general, our image interpolation, this is just what's used by default. I keep mine on nearest neighbor. Uh, unless I'm working with video and intend to be doing aspect ratio corrections, then I'll change this uh, image interpolation to bilinear as my default and click OK. So now if I needed to uh, transform this, I could uh, apply a transform and it's going to leverage uh, it's going to leverage my uh, bilinear. So now I can enter exact pixel dimensions, etc. It's going to use bilinear to do whatever changes I apply there. And of course, it's important to uh, point out that uh, now also in Detective 7.5, which we released earlier this year. So uh, you have the option of working with video and Photoshop and the Clear ID filters, leveraging the Clear ID filters uh, on smart objects uh, with the 3.4 version coming out soon, as well as Detective 7.5. We now have 15 Clear ID filters, uh, almost all of the Clear ID filters uh, in the Detective suite as well, in addition to Spotlight, Magnify, Arithmetic, Developer, uh, so on and so forth. Uh, so uh, certainly something to uh, consider there as well. How are the questions, Charles? Uh, I think we answered the question of do Clear ID user recorded actions have to remain within the three dash Clear ID folder in order to work? Uh, no, you can create those are action sets and you can create whatever number of action sets you want, name them what you want. You can have an action set that's your user shortcuts, uh, like Larry was showing you how to hotkey verification report. Right. Uh, that was just something I or we uh, laid out just to, as an outline to show, you know, how that would work to people that aren't used to action sets and actions. Um, what clear, uh, clear ID recorded? Oh, uh, yeah, right. And other words, do, yeah, so we answered that. That's really the only question. If people do have uh, questions, they can start populating them here, um, and we will get to them as I believe we're right now just going over the website stuff, right, Larry? Yeah, we're. Uh, looks like we got most of the questions just about uh, where actions are stored. Can you store them outside of those folders? Yeah, those action sets were just there for uh, convenience um, that, that we install with Clear ID 3.3, that processing example action set, et cetera. Um, so if I, you know, uh, just to, to show you, you know, I created a whole new action set and recorded um, uh, 
you know, and placed an action inside that action set and then exported that out to my case folder. Um, so you don't have to have these. Anytime you want to remove an action set, you can, you know, just highlight it and click the trash icon in the actions panel to remove it. Um, but remember, if the action set isn't loaded, the action itself won't be available to you. So you have to have the action sets you want to work with uh, loaded in order to access them. You don't have to have them expanded, of course, but you do have to have them loaded in the actions panel to have them accessible through Photoshop or through Bridge uh, when going to image processor. Now, what's kind of nice is in a, uh, a lab uh, unit where you have multiple people doing processing, uh, you can, you know, if you're pointed to a shared storage location, you could build out your own uh, set of actions and share them between each other very easily, loading them and updating them, et cetera. Right. So with that said, uh, web resources, obviously our website, we have a number of videos and uh, help documentation, FAQs, uh, as well as our uh, store website. Um, so our new store website. Um, we can get to the products and our forums uh, where we have FAQ information. Uh, you can log in and uh, see the latest, um, greatest announcements and everything through our forums. Um, and then uh, Twitter, our Twitter account, uh, where we release all of our latest information generally goes out via Twitter. So um, that's embedded into our website as well, so you'll see that. Um, and keep an eye out for uh, future webinars and training events, uh, including uh, remote training events. And with that said, that's pretty much uh, all I had for today. I really apologize for the beginning uh, and overlooking sharing my screen. Uh, that was entirely my fault for the first uh, 10 minutes there. I'm talking away and not, uh, not even paying attention, so my uh, apologies. Thank everyone uh, for joining us today. Uh, should you have any questions, feel free to reach out via email, phone, uh, we look forward to speaking with you. Thank you so much for your time.